If members of the public are leaving the gallery, could they please do so quickly? The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12808 in the name of George Adam on My Life, My MS. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on John, George Adam to open the debate. Mr Adam, seven minutes. At this point, thank you for your ongoing support of the MS community. Because before I, there's been much talk of me being an MS champion. Before I was in the Parliament, you were that champion within the Scottish Parliament. And can I once again thank everyone for their ongoing support during MS Awareness Week? Because as of this moment, Stacey is currently very happy with the way things are going. But she ha wants me to remind everyone that there's still plenty of badges, there's still plenty of information at the stall, and can you all go there as soon as possible? Because last year I welcomed everyone to Stacey's annual MS debate, because we all know I'm kidding myself on otherwise, because she is the real reason why I'm here talking about this issue today. And uh, once again, she's watching from her balcony position in the public gal gallery, ensuring that I stay on message and get all the correct points across. And I also mentioned last year that it felt like a scene from Romeo and Juliet as I continued to speak. And since this year is like my MS, my MS, my life, I would like to add that ours is not a tale of woe like that of Juliet and her Romeo. Because although multiple sclerosis is part of our lives, it's amazing what old grade English gets you. <laughs> It has not limited either of our ambitions or goals. It has made things more difficult, and we may need to organise a night out as if it's like Normandy D-Day landings. But MS has not stopped us from doing or achieving anything that we've wanted to do. Presiding officer, I recently attended the MS Society Scotland Living with MS conference in Glasgow, and it was attended by over 200 people living with MS. And as I said before, many of the people in the MS community are very upbeat, refusing to allow this horrible, debilitating disease be to beat them. I chaired the whole conference and did not hear anyone really complain. This outlook in life is to be commended, but it also causes us problems as a campaigning community. It stops us from being a major part of the ongoing political dialogue in the health portfolio. So we need to moan a wee bit more. But this MS Awareness Week is so important because it gives us the opportunity to see what, th what is happening within the community at present. We need to ensure uh, that the estimated 11,000 people in Scotland with MS have their voices heard. And ironically, it's more women than men who develop MS. The ratio is approximately three to one. And I feel I need to mention the following because those that live with MS are aware of the following facts. But for the record, I'd just like to say that multiple sclerosis is a progressive neurodegenerative condition which affects the brain and central nervous system. It is also an autoimmune disease and there's currently no cure. Scotland has amongst the highest preference rates of MS in the world, around one person in every 500. And there are three types of MS, relapse remitting MS, primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS. In my own situation, Stacey had relapse and remitting when we first met, and uh, now it's moved on to a more progressive form, secondary progressive MS. And that's how it happens in MS, because everyone is different and all their conditions are different as well. But uh, what happens, uh, you know, during the debate at the Living with MS conference, one of the, uh, the research communications officers for the MS Society, Emily Burns. I felt sorry for her because she said it might be genetic. It might be because of the lack of sun. The fact the north, further north you go from the equator, the more incidents you get. But we don't quite know. And that's one of the problems that we have. And it becomes quite frustrating for families dealing with it because you don't know. It's not something that you can just find a cure for. But at this stage, presiding officer, I would like to highlight some of the challenges that are affecting people with MS at the moment. One of the biggest issues is welfare. As we all know, there's the welfare reform at the moment, and there's many people with multiple sclerosis who have difficulty trying to get work. Now, on the negative side, many of them would like to work but cannot work, and they are diagnosed nine times out of ten between the ages of 20 and 40, which is a major part of their working life. So I would say that when you're dealing with uh, the situations with DLA and PIP, the 20-metre rule for a start does not help, because although someone with MS may be able to walk 
walk 20 metres, they may spend the rest of the day in bed because of the fatigue in doing that. And there is also the fact that many of the so-called experts assessing this do not understand MS and many of the things that can happen. And also the very pressure of going through this type of uh, system will possibly in many cases create an MS attack itself. You know, there's an interesting case when we're talking about my MS, my life, the MS Society have got a woman called Audrey Barnett who's given evidence to this parliament before and uh, she says I didn't, she's from, uh, she's diagnosed with MS in 1995 and she's from Inverness and she says I didn't choose to have MS but my experience of the benefits system made me feel like a scrounger. I worked for the Department of Work and Pensions for 16 years before being accepted for medical retirement. And then she ended up having a situation where she had to fight for the very basic benefits. Now, there's also those good news stories of people who have employers who work very well. And Ewan Marshall from West Lothian was diagnosed with MS in 2006. And he said he made the decision to tell his manager straight away. And her reaction was fantastic. I've even been promoted to senior server engineer. Nothing... Nothing's a problem with my employer as long as I let them know what's happening. One of my main symptoms is fatigue, and it's my biggest enemy at work, but my condition is getting worse, but I have good support package in place at work. So it shows that employers can as well ensure work with people with MS to ensure that they can still work. You know, the, one of the other... Uh, one of the many ongoing issues that we have with uh, is access to medicine. Now, last year I brought up the fact that not only is not just a case of actually getting three out of uh, all three of the last year of drugs that have been submitted to the SMC have actually been passed for MS. Now, that's great, but there are still many other drugs like Vampira, which I asked the Cabinet Secretary about today, which hasn't been submitted, which hasn't been put forward, which could make a massive difference in other people's, um, people dealing with MS life. It's quite simple as the difference between someone being able to walk and not walk in this drugs case in many people's cases. So I would like to say, presiding officer, you know, in a closing, I would like to say that uh, MS is part of our life. It doesn't define me. I love my wife, Stacey, and I would not have achieved as much if I had not had her love and support and guidance over the years. Yes, we live with MS, but it does not control our lives. It's part of it, but it does not define us as a couple. We will continue to dealing with whatever the condition throws up and together as a community, those living with MS will continue to fight everything that comes in our way. Thank you, Mr Adam. Can I just say to members that it's likely that we will need to extend the debate because we've got so many people who wish to speak. Um, I'm intending to allow everybody four minutes and I hope to get everybody in, but if you don't want to use four minutes, please don't feel obliged to do so. Uh, Dennis Robertson, followed by Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, I shall heed your words and do my best. Presiding officer, I'm delighted to take part in this debate this afternoon. And, and when we talk about uh, conditions like MS, we sometimes think of a genetic and it's a disease. And we sometimes forget that it's individuals, it's people, it is a person. It is a disease that affects a person. And that person deserves that individualism, that, that person-centred approach to their own lives. And when George Adam talks about, you know, Stacey and the way that he does, the young romantic that he's trying to be, um, what, what, it, it reminds me, it, it reminds me that we all have challenges but challenges present opportunities. And those with MS, the ones that I certainly know, have a can-do attitude. It's not that they don't want to get on. It's not that they don't want to be part of the, the world of work. They do. We sometimes, as society, as, as people with no understanding, little understanding, lack of awareness, put up the barriers... And when George Adam talks about the employers, yes, employers need to be educated. And yes, employers, if they were only giving people the opportunity to get into work, would see the benefits of that work. Because, presiding officer, a person with a disability or an illness that remains in work, that employer sees the benefit more than, I think, any other person that probably is working for them at any given time. Because that person appreciates that uh, aspect of being part of that.
that work and that community. But what would we have done? We put up barriers, presiding officer, access to work, little known benefit quite often from the UK government. But George Adams is right. Those that assess those that are requiring that assistance, whether it be in work or whether it be for motability, quite often they're looking at a tick list. They don't take that individual, that person-centred approach to that individual. Presiding officer, my ask, and I think the ask of this parliament, is that we treat MS, we treat the person, we accept them as individuals with individual requirements and individual needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Robertson. Jenny Mara, followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I congratulate George Adam for securing this debate today to mark MS Awareness Week? And can I also thank him for his ongoing commitment and that of his wife, Stacey, as well, and their dedication uh, to the work on this disease that has such an impact on this country? I, too, have a family connection with MS and know the impact that this condition has on partners, children and, and parents as well. As we know, Scotland has some of the highest incidence of multiple scler sclerosis anywhere in the world. There are many people in this country all too aware of this condition and so many families affected by it. But because we still understand so little about the condition, we cannot properly explain why this is so. The research shows, presiding officer, our neighbours across the Atlantic in Canada also appear to have a similar pattern of MS as to Sweden and Denmark, while those warmer climates closer to the equator have extremely low levels. Yet geography is not an explanation in itself, with certain ethnic groups having a lower prevalence and MS considerably more common among women. And whether it's genetics or climate, we cannot say for sure. Perhaps one day we will solve this. And there are grounds for optimism as we look ahead to how we tackle MS. I understand from the excellent work of the MS Society that there are a number of new potential treatments which are not yet available but in the pipeline. And these were raised at health questions in this chamber earlier. This is no small part down to the extensive campaigning and fundraising the MS Society do to help fund research. Presiding officer, just this week we learned that scientists in Edinburgh are to receive £2 million for research into stem cells with a view to understanding how MS develops. And it is right that we acknowledge the extraordinary work of the MS Society this week. With the number of neurologists and provision of MRI machines growing considerably, we have made significant progress globally in treating and supporting those with MS in recent years. And I believe we can look to the future with some confidence in how we understand this disease, how we treat and support the growing number of people who live with MS, fulfilling their lives, and ultimately our ambition of curing MS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mara. Nanette Milne, to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by adding my thanks to George Adam for lodging this motion. All of us in the Chamber are aware of his personal circumstances and also know of his commitment to raising awareness of multiple sclerosis and to promoting the best care and treatment for all those whose lives are affected by it. Scotland has one of the highest incidences of MS in the world, with an estimated 11,000 people in our country currently diagnosed with the condition. One of an increasing number of known autoimmune conditions, we know that presently there is no cure, like many neurological diseases. But it's a credit to the MS Society at a UK level that in the last 60 years, over £150 million have been raised to research the condition with the final goal of actually finding a cure. It's interesting to note that MS is more prevalent in women than men, with a ratio of 3 to 1. Needless to say, I won't personally be taking part in the Great Women's 10K run in Glasgow in two weeks' time, but this women-only fundraising event shows the determination of women across Scotland to show their support for finding a cure for MS, and I wish the 10,000 participants the best of luck and very happy running. The MS Society in Scotland has branches across the country, and in the region which I represent, there's the well-used Stuart Resource Centre in Aberdeen. For people throughout the city and Aberdeenshire, this facility provides help and support for people and their families with MS through a wide range of activities from fundraising to social events. 
The cake break and open day at the centre last year was a good example of communities coming together on a social basis to raise awareness of the condition. And it is important that as many people as possible should be made aware that MS can and does affect many lives. From a personal perspective, like George Adam and Jenny Mara, I too have a close family member who faces the challenges of living with MS. Though fortunately, my relative's condition is only fairly, a fairly minor incapacity at the present time. Unfortunately, and I wouldn't like to be critical of NHS care, the person I'm referring to was diagnosed with MS nearly 10 years ago, and as far as I'm aware, hasn't been seen by an MS clinical nurse since diagnosis, which makes me slightly sceptical of the claim that an MS patient is reviewed every 12 months. What I'm unclear about is who triggers the contact with the MH MS nurse. Is it the patient or is it the GP? I'd be grateful if the minister could enlighten me so that I can follow this up. It's encouraging that according to the most recent data from 2013, the number of people newly diagnosed with MS who've had contact with an MS specialist nurse has gone up by 11% on the previous year. But that is still only 57% of those newly diagnosed patients, which isn't yet good enough and appears to be variable across the country. The theme of this year's MS campaign focuses on people with MS and their right to continue in education and employment. The family member I mentioned was retired from full-time work by the time he was diagnosed, although he may have had some unrecognised warning symptoms many years before. But it is worth reiterating that most people who are diagnosed fall within the 20 to 40 age bracket, the time when most people are either in further education or working. It's worrying that only a quarter of people with MS are actually in employment compared to three quarters of the UK population. Indeed, approximately 75% of people with MS feel that their working lives and career have been harmed by their diagnosis. It's also saddening to know that MS sufferers can end up unemployed within the first 10 years after diagnosis. The obvious effect this has on people with MS doesn't just lead to understandable depression, but also to financial insecurity. By being unable to work through symptoms such as intense pain, extreme fatigue, mobility problems, and in the worst cases, factors such as vision loss and incontinence, MS can present a huge burden, not only to the individual, but also to the, his or her family. MS Society Scotland does a huge amount of work to raise awareness of multiple sclerosis, and this week of focus on the condition should stand out as a sign that it cannot and should not be ignored. Again, my thanks to George Adam for securing the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Liam MacArthur, followed by Chick Brodie. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I, too, uh, join with others in congratulating George Adam on securing this uh, debate again this year? It's a cause to which he's shown a great dedication over the years and uh, an issue in which he's provided considerable insights from personal experience, insights that on occasions may have gone beyond uh, what his wife Stacey was comfortable to sanction. Uh, the theme of this year's campaign, My Life, My MS, allows us to reflect uh, on a whole range of issues that influence the life of people living with MS, how they and their families and friends are impacted by a diagnosis and how they then receive ongoing care and support. This is very pertinent, as from all I've learned about MS, including in preparing for my own members' debate on this subject two years ago, uh, it strikes me, as it has others, that this is a very individual disease. As I observed back then, the causes are as yet unclear, and I will come back to that shortly. But the symptoms are also hard to pin down. They can include intense pain, mobility and coordination problems, severe depression, fatigue, incontinence, and loss of vision, as Nanette Milne uh, refer to. For some people, uh, there are periods of relapse and remission. For others, the pattern is one of progressive deterioration. That variability can make life more complicated for sufferers and those around them. People often assume that sufferers will be wheelchair-bound or very old, yet diagnosis invariably takes place between the ages of 20 and 40. Many of the symptoms are invisible and they can come and go. I suspect that this makes the task of supporting those with a diagnosis less than straightforward. Those who have been diagnosed quite naturally want to know what to expect next. And as one of my constituents, Angela Monteith, who has been helping fellow sufferers for many years, both directly and through her work uh, with the MS Society, explained to me, answering that question is not easy. The disease is never the same for everyone. And post-diagnosis, it is almost impossible to predict the future. In terms of the support available, again, as I pointed out in my debate in 2013, things are patchy. Clinical standards for neurological uh, conditions, including MS, were published in 2009. But the, these are not uh, always being met. There are certainly examples of excellent and innovative practice, 
uh, but uh, this is not being applied perhaps as widely as any of us uh, would wish to see. I'm pleased to say that uh, NHS Orkney is meeting the MS standard for service provision. Partnership working involving physios, speech therapists, doctors and occupational therapists, as well as local groups and charities representing people with MS and other neurological conditions, has made this all possible. In an island community, of course, MS sufferers and their families face some unique additional problems. Although regular get-togethers are held, they can be hard to attend for people living on the smaller outer islands, and the sense of isolation can often exacerbate other problems they may be facing. The costs of patients travelling to Aberdeen for neurological checkups are high, though the increasing use of telehealth is helping in this regard. The local MS nurse in Orkney supports patients during such teleconsultations with the Aberdeen-based neurologist, saving money but critically reducing the physical and emotional strain of having to travel long distances. As if these challenges were not enough, of course, Orkney and Shetland also have the highest incidence of MS, not just in Scotland but anywhere in the world. The reasons for this are unclear, so I very much welcome the research currently being undertaken to try and uncover some of the answers. There's the welcome recent announcement that Jenny Mara referred to of the £2 million for stem cell research. In addition, Dr Jim Wilson, himself an Arcadian, continues his groundbreaking work at Edinburgh University. I was interested here recently about the research being done by PhD student Emily Weiss. Working alongside Dr Wilson, Emily is trying to establish how heritable MS is, what role genetics play in determining risk, and what the environmental risks are, including exposure to ultraviolet radiation from sunlight. In terms of genetics, a good deal of work has already been done in gathering data through the NIMS and ORCADES projects. It will be fascinating to see what Emily and her colleagues are able to extract from this. Likewise, the Viking Health Study in Shetland has pulled together good base data that will hopefully better inform our understanding of the impact that sunlight exposure on vitamin D deficiency and therefore risk of MS actually is. Firm conclusions may be some way off, ways of mitigating risks further away still. In the meantime, therefore, we need to get better at understanding and catering for the specific needs of MS sufferers and their families. Presiding officer, I congratulate George Adam once again on keeping this issue at the top of uh, our minds and, uh, and our understanding. And thank all those in Orkney and across Scotland who help support those with MS to uh, ensure that, like Stacey, MS does not define them. Thank you, Chick Brody, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I add my thanks also to, to George Adam uh, for this debate. The last debate I mentioned uh, my boss and my mentor at NCR Dundee, Laurie Elder, uh, who, who had this illness uh, and whose strength and courage guide me still. The debate allows us to look once again, uh, and that recurrence is very important, to look once again at the issues that affect people with MS uh, and the impact it has on them and their families. Uh, that too is important because I know the impact, not all bad, that it had on, on uh, Laurie's family. It also allows us to ensure we continually review the care and the support we give to people with MS and their carers. That too is very important. Presiding officer, MS affects around one in 600 people, over 100,000 people in the UK. Uh, and an estimated 10,000 uh, people in Scotland. I eschew the notion uh, often attributed that it is a disability. It's not. It's an illness. MS diagnosis is usually affected between the ages of 20 and 40, so it affects people relatively early in life, with roughly three times more women uh, than men uh, having MS. The MS Society recently unveiled its strategy that runs from 2015 to 2019, uh, it's very appropriate. The uh, mission statement reads, and I quote, to enable everyone affected by MS to live life to their full potential and secure care and support that they need until we ultimately find a cure and one will be found. In its strategy, the MS Society laid out seven key goals. So if I may just address the first three. Um, on on uh, effective treatments, the MS Society said it aims to double its funding into research in the next five years. Uh, as MSPs uh, and a parliament, we have to, we must, we need to influence and pressurise pharmaceutical companies, for example, to improve access to treatments that already exist. Negotiations with the SMC, the Scottish Medicines Consortium, to make access to these medicines must be pursued to make them as available and as open as possible. To sum this 
uh, uh, this accessibility uh, with pricing, etc., is a, is a black art, and it's time we shone a light upon it. And, presiding officer, the EMS Society rightly pushes for large-scale rolling clinical trials. We also require a small-scale trial on vitamin D as a potential disease-modifying uh, treatment. And internationalisation and cross-fertilisation of ideas and information uh, is a keystone to build a bridge to find the ultimate effective treatment. The second goal was on responsive care and support. It's absolutely essential that access to treatments is person-centred and coordinated so that it recognises people with MS as equal partners. In 2010, the Scottish Government unveiled the Long-Term Conditions Collaborative with the aim of improving pathways for those suffering with MS, encouraging integrated care and delivering care uh, closer to home. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence also published its guide to management of MS in primary and secondary care. It makes recommendations supporting an integrated support approach, but also has a focus on access to local services, in particular to groups uh, and carer uh, support. And family love and care, of course, is the foundation uh, of all of that. And I know that Doris Elder and the boys contributed uh, greatly to, to, to Laurie, particularly in his later life. Earlier this week, we discussed the future of work programmes in Scotland. And in that debate, I argued for all work programmes to be devolved to Scotland that would allow the integrated approach that everyone agrees is essential. The MS Society, in its submission to the Welfare Reform Committee in 2013, stated that around 60% of work capability assessment centres were inaccessible. 80% felt that their health suffered by WCA assessments and that 69% of those questioned were not, were not offered any help to get them into work. We need to bring all work programmes to Scotland to ensure, among others, MS sufferers in Scotland have the best accessibility to, to employment. And finally, uh, presiding officer, in terms of preventing MS, I believe, from what I've read and following the issue, that we are much closer to understanding what causes MS, and each day, I believe, the resolution comes closer. We know it's caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors, and we need to accelerate research into what causes MS, including time and resource to run prevention trials. Presiding officer, let's make sure we, all of us, and politicians particularly, play our part in securing the MS mission statement to enable everyone affected by MS to live life to their full potential and secure the care and the support they need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call Malcolm Chisholm, uh, due to the number of members who wish to speak on this debate, I am minded to accept that motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I invite George Adam to make such a motion? Proposed, yes. Thank you. The question is, are members agreed that we extend the debate this evening? We are agreed. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Um, President Officer, I congratulate George Adam for once again introducing a debate on this important subject and championing the, championing the cause following in your own footsteps, Presiding uh, Officer. I also welcome the MS Society uh, to the Parliament uh, this week. Uh, it has been my privilege and I am sure the privilege of many members to talk to them and read their materials and learn uh, from them. I think it is a feature of neurological uh, conditions that um, so many of them have great uh, champions and indeed uh, providers. I myself, for example, am patron of the MS um, Therapy Centre in Leith, which provides um, highly valued support services uh, and innovative therapies to people in Edinburgh and indeed uh, beyond. And I would pay tribute to the superb manager and the dedicated volunteers uh, who work in that centre. Going back to the MS Society, I think in particular we should welcome uh, the award that we've already heard about from Jenny Mara uh, two, of £2 million to the Edinburgh Centre for MS uh, Research, I think for work on primary progressive uh, MS. The particular focus um, of that centre is, is, is stem cells in the hope of building uh, a clearer picture of how MS develops and better, a better method for modelling the condition and finding effective treatment. So I think we all welcome uh, that announcement uh, this week. My only complaint about the MS Society is that for some reason I didn't uh, uh, receive their very 
um, a thorough briefing for the debate, which I just see on my colleague's desk beside me. But I have uh, read um, their strategy 2015 to 2019, and in fact they presented on that at um, the last but one meeting of the cross-party group uh, on MS. And um, like uh, Chick Brody, I, I won't uh, refer to the seven priorities in their totality, but um, merely mention two or three. I, I mean, I was particularly struck by the emphasis on responsive care and support that recognises people with MS as equal partners in their care. I think that's a general principle that we've tried to develop um, in health over the last uh, few years, and it, it, it's particularly important, uh, obviously, for people with, with long-term uh, conditions. And again, the voluntary sector are very much champions of that uh, approach uh, to care. Their first um, priority mentioned uh, was effective treatments, and again, that very much overlaps with the campaign that um, the MS Society had last year, the Treat Me Right campaign, which was uh, the subject of the debate at this time last year, and that was partly about better access to medicines, but also about um, access to a multidisciplinary team and access uh, to a specialist. I think since, since uh, uh, last year we've had the welcome announcement from the Scottish Government uh, of a fund for specialist nurses, so I think it would be appropriate to express the wish that some of that money should go to nurse specialists for MS, because we all know that when we talk to people with neurological and indeed other conditions that nurse specialists are very, very um, gr uh, greatly valued, which of course Gord why Gordon, Gordon Aikman and his great campaigning has emphasised the importance of nurse specialists for NMD. But access to specialists and a regular review every 12 months was also part of uh, the campaign last year. And of course that's one of uh, many neurological standards. It was a great advance when we had clinical standards for neurology. Uh, but when the Neurological Alliance did a report on that, um, admittedly two or three years ago, they did highlight uh, the postcode lottery of care when it came to the implementation of those standards. So there's still work to be done in terms of that, but also, of course, in terms of uh, social care, because support there is also variable. So effective integration is obviously going to be crucial for people with MS and other neurological conditions, um, and, and several issues, in fact, specifically to neurology, were, were raised in the recent debate on health and social care uh, integration. But the final point I would make here is, well, two final points. One is, let's make sure we effectively involve the voluntary sector in integration, but also let's make sure that while looking forward to guidance on localism, we must have a degree of central direction so that we get rid of the postcode lottery of care, whether in health or social care. Thank you. Uh, can I now call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by John Finney? Thank you very much. And I too congratulate George Adam on bringing this motion for debate today. I've enjoyed working with him as Deputy Convener in the cross-party group on MS, which continues to bring important issues to the attention of the Parliament, as well as occasionally uh, less weighty matters. Uh, multiple sclerosis impacts on the everyday lives of people living with the condition to different degrees and in different ways. I have friends with MS who have maintained a high quality of life and mobility for years after diagnosis. Equally, I know others for whom their physical deterioration has been both rapid and painful. MS also varies from area to area. Scotland has indeed one of the highest rates of prevalence in the world, and Aberdeen and the North East have among the highest in Scotland. Out of 451 new cases in mainland health board areas in 2013, 64 were recorded in Grampian, significantly more than Grampian's population share would suggest. The incidence in Orkney is even higher, and as Liam MacArthur said, patients from the Northern Isles also access specialised medical services in Aberdeen either in person or by video link. There are currently some 15 whole time equivalent MS nurses in Scotland for some 11,000 people with the condition, of which three whole time equivalent posts cover Grampian and the Northern Isles. Even a modest increase in these numbers uh, would clearly go a long way. The MS Trust is campaigning to increase the number of specialist MS nurses across the UK, and the MS Society has called on the Scottish Government to allocate part of its funds announced in January for specialist nursing and care, allocate part of that to increasing the number of specialist MS nurses who make such a difference to patients' lives. And I hope the Minister uh, will be able to respond positively to that call, which has been re uh, repeated this evening by Malcolm Chisholm. 
<clears throat> of course, support for people with MS is not just down to the NHS. Local councils and patients' own organisations also play a part. I heard earlier today from a constituent who was uh, enthused by the excellent Keep Fit class at the Stuart Resource Centre, which Danette Mill mentioned, one of many such activities and events organised by the Aberdeen branch of the MS Society. It has very effective outreach, for example, uh, MS Awareness exhibition at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary recently, uh, and a Living Well with MS event in Bankery. And Keep Fit has been taken to a whole new level by sport and exercise students at the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen who have organised uh, bespoke exercise classes designed in collaboration with the local branch of the MS Society uh, and the students not only design the courses but are also providing support to those people taking part. And Sue Ryder Care has just launched the 5 R's programme in Aberdeen with support from the Big Lottery Fund. The 5 R's are relaxation, rebuilding, re-energising, reintegrating and regenerating all of which are very relevant to people with MS. And along with relaxing activities, that programme offers some very practical advice as well. So there's lots going on at a local level, but most important of all, as a number of members have mentioned, is the work being done to understand what causes MS and what treatments can make the biggest difference to patients' lives. The MS Society's smart trials of different neurological drugs are part of that. And so are the risk-sharing schemes which have been undertaken by NICE at a UK level. When the Minister responds to the debate, I'm sure he will address the issue of support for MS nurses to help existing patients. I would ask him also to tell us how the Government envisages Scotland playing our part in the quest for better treatments uh, for MS in the future. Thank you. <coughs> John Finney to be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I too add my congratulations to George um, uh, uh, for, for all his work on this, and actually for framing what is a very practical motion. I, 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 I very much appreciate the wordings in there. Dennis Robertson told us it is about persons, and when you are saying my, my uh, life, my MS, it is very much to, to concern with the individual. And as the motion goes on to say, explores the whole person. And the campaign will look at all the issues that influence the lives of people with MS. Well, these are the same issues that influence all of us, but with the added challenge, and that's a phrase that we've heard in, in the debate already. And these are not just simply health. They are about housing and the, the difficulties sometimes with AIDS and adaptations, with transport, with increasing problems as people's mobility authors, and with education. And that was, uh, I think, Chick Brody that mentioned about employment there and uh, there's certainly a long way to go with some education as regards the treatment of people with MS. I, I assisted a constituent for whom their employer thought it was entirely unreasonable to make a reasonable adjustment and I have to tell you an extremely modest adjustment. So yes, some way to go with that. Um, um, colleague uh, Lee MacArthur talks about isolation which is another factor that can impact and in which um, his constituency is a, is a very clear example. I had a look online this morning about MS, and of course, as with everything, there's a, a wide range of issues. A lot of it is about fundraising and the commendable activities that take place um, uh, around the, the country and around the world. Also, uh, um, a lot of coverage of the Edinburgh Centre, which I won't repeat, but I was delighted when I did look at um, the, the, the website to find that um, the management board is made up of independent MS research scientists and people affected by MS. I think that is terribly important that, again, we keep it, using the term that's been used previously, person-centred, that this isn't something that's done to people, that this is something where there's an active, active in, involvement with. I think in last year's debate I, I, I mentioned a, a young woman in the challenge of securing uh, um, a drug. Uh, delighted to see that that matter is resolved. And that isn't just to the individual's benefit, that's the benefit of the family, and particular uh, uh, the, the wee boy they have. So there is a clamour for a cure, and it's an understandable clamour, and there's a clamour for drugs to ameliorate the effects of it. Vitamin D is not just simply mentioned in relation to MS, it is mentioned in relation to other matters. Um, I'm always impressed with the energy I, I encounter with people associated with MS. I, in the last year, I visited uh, the Kirkwall, Oban, Loch Gilpid, and I'm regular at the Inverness Centre there. And the energy of people who assist and the energy of people who, who have the illness is, is very, very commendable. Um, we know that this campaign is the latest in a series, uh, and again, the, it talks about caring and support. And we have to ask ourselves who's going to do the caring and who's going to do the supporting. And I say that there's a pivotal role for this uh, establishment here to do that. Um, there are um, 
Politics is about priorities, and if your priorities are to replace weapons of mass destruction uh, ahead of putting that funding to a more constructive use for humanity, then these ch financial challenges aren't just going to be restricted to uh, the welfare reform and the austerity programme. And the difficulties, as George uh, Adam highlighted, about this 20, um, 20 metre walk. So the hallmark for me of people who uh, are involved in MS is a, a stoicism. They're not going to give in to that. As someone, I think Chick Brody said, there is, a, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm sure um, with proper funding for research, that tunnel will get shorter. And uh, hopefully that's sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Neil Findlay. Uh, thanks, President Officer. And I also thank George Adam for submitting the motion for debate and also for his chairing of the cross-party group. Uh, it doesn't seem like a year since their last debate on this subject, but I'm sure for the 600 or so people newly diagnosed since this time last year, the last 12 months have felt more uh, like a lifetime, because that is how many more people will have had this life-changing uh, diagnosis since we last debated. 600 people, 600 families whose lives will change forever. And it's, of course, easy to over-dramatise the impact of a certain condition in order to make a, a political or an emotional point, but I think MS must be one of the most frustrating and exasperating of conditions. It's the variability, the sudden attacks after periods of being well, leading to periods away from work or ending a career altogether that leaves people floored through fatigue and mental as well as physical exhaustion. And for those with progressive MS, the downward spiral and the lack of respite from it and the absence of effective drugs to help or cure is, is almost as bad as the illness itself. And I, I would um, therefore welcome the additional £2 million that is going to the centre that's been mentioned by so many people. Um, like George Adam, my interest comes from my, my own family and experience of uh, sufferers in my close circle of friends, fit, able, sociable, working men and women, one a professional footballer, another one my brother, another one my auntie, all uh, hit by this very debilitating illness and all left very much to their own devices to work their way through a system where information that should be easily available wasn't. And last year at the MS parliamentary reception, I heard Elizabeth Quigley very eloquently and powerfully speak about MS being shrouded in secrets, about patients always having to go in search of help and advice, always having to ask people where to get that advice instead of being offered it up front of not being made aware of new drugs and treatments, but having to plead with health boards to get them, of being unaware of how councils and voluntary organisations can help until somehow months or even years later through some obscure circuitous route that in that information is passed on and often that information passed on way too late. And Elizabeth's speech that night I think was absolutely spot on and you could see it rang uh, a bell with uh, people in the uh, in the room, uh, certainly uh, struck a chord with uh, my family members. So, in an information-filled age, uh, often it appears that the information you need is the hardest to come by. And patients need help. They need to know what services are available. They need to know that there are new developments. They need their MS nurse, if indeed they have one, and if they see them, uh, to advise them of new developments. They need consultants to tell them what help they can get not just ask them at their, at their annual assessment if indeed they get one. The same question as last year, which we could probably paraphrase as, how have you been? I'm OK. OK, see you next year. They need to know that places like Lukey House eh, is available for respite and care and how to access funding to go there for that, treat that care. I asked them um, five long-suffering MS patients I know if they had heard of Lukey House. None of them had. None of them had. Yet all of them could have been benefiting from the array of services it provides. And these people, these are people with good family support around them. I have no idea how people with little family or social support cope and find out these things. So, President Officer, these are very important matters for people who are suffering. I also um, very briefly want to mention the cost of items to assist people with MS and other disabilities. Ramps for wheelchairs. 100 quid, a decent wheelchair, 1,500 quid, a, an automated roof box to carry a chair, a few thousand pounds, the fitting of hand controls in a car, another few hundred quid, seats and adaptations, the list, the expensive list 
goes on and on and on. All additional pressures and costs and people who often uh, have, like my brother and two friends, have had to give up their work or have had to go on reduced hours because of their condition. Finally, President Officer, on a brighter note, uh, my brother and uh, an MS sufferer of 20 years gets married next month. So uh, I wish him and his uh, wife, Sharon, uh, his wife to be Sharon well as they battle MS together. Thank you. I'm sure we all with, uh, wish your brother and his bride to be very well indeed. Can I call on Jimmy Hepburn, Minister, to wind up the debate about seven minutes? Thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, begin by joining with uh, everyone in thanking George Adam uh, for uh, raising this motion, bringing it uh, to the Chamber for debate, and for uh, the, uh, all the members who have uh, taken part in uh, the debate uh, as well. I'd like to thank them too. And uh, Also, could I take the opportunity to congratulate MS Society on uh, their work. Uh, members have spoken various about much of the good work that uh, takes place on the ground. And, uh, I, I know from my own engagement with uh, Common Alden District MS Society in my area the, the great work they uh, undertake in supporting people uh, locally uh, in the community uh, they serve. I can also thank uh, George Adam for all uh, the work he does in this uh, parliament to raise interest and awareness about MS uh, as well as others have uh, remarked upon. We all know uh, how highly people with MS value the practical and emotional uh, support the MS uh, Society offers, and it's uh, great uh, that support extends to uh, families uh, and carers. I'm very proud to say that the Scottish Government has a long and close working relationship with the MS Society. We share their view that everyone with a neurological condition such as MS is able to uh, live uh, life to their full potential and secure uh, the care and support uh, that they need, uh, and this, of course, includes uh, their families and uh, carers being told that you uh, have a condition for which there may be no cure can be devastating and uh, individuals respond to this in different ways. So we must recognise that the uh, change which matter most and can make the biggest differences to people's lives are not in the power of researchers or clinicians. It's important that a person living with a neurological condition is able to decide what support they need when it uh, is to be delivered by uh, whom. Uh, Personalised and integrated services for adults uh, living with a, a neurological condition will be strengthened further by the implementation of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Act and the Public Bodies Joint Working Act, accompanied by the right advice and information. Self-directed support can play a crucial role in helping people living with a neurological condition to achieve better outcomes and better quality uh, support and to improve outcomes for patients, service users, carers and their families. Health boards and local authorities should work together alongside the third sector, which is Malcolm Chisholm uh, referred to as being so uh, uh, crucial uh, in that regard to effectively uh, deliver quality, sustainable uh, care services. We continue to work with our partners and local government to ensure there is more consistency and fairness in the way people are charged. We will consider very carefully what further action we can take to ensure the delivery of uh, fairer care for the, the people of Scotland. Uh, some members spoke about the importance of uh, research. Lewis Macdonald asked what role can we play as a country, the Chief Scientist Office has given more than £644,000 for MS research projects in Scotland in recent years. It also provides funding of £475,000 per year for the Scottish Dementia and Neurodegenerative Disease Research Network. We also see elsewhere the Anne Ruling Clinic at the University of Edinburgh. The role of the clinic is, of course, to improve patients' lives through research by translating laboratory discoveries into clinical trials and new therapies. As other members have referred to, we have seen the announcement in recent days the MS Society is investing a further £2 million into the Edinburgh Centre for MS, MS Research and the National Institute for Health Research uh, Technology Assessment uh, grant has been awarded to Dr uh, Dory McClurg at Glasgow Caledonian University uh, to undertake a, a, a £750,000 pounds project which will study the effectiveness of abdominal massage for uh, neurogenic bowel dysfunction in people with multiple sclerosis. We will always be willing to see uh, research projects come forward. And I do hope that we as a country can play our part in improving treatments for MS. And one, of one of those treatments might be new medicines. George Adams spoke about access to medicines. I, I think it is important to uh, make clear that all treatments for MS that have been submitted by pharmaceutical com companies to the Scottish Medicine Consortium have been recommended for use in uh, NHS Scotland. There are two medicines for the treatment of MS which have been licensed but have not been uh, recommended, uh, Satifex and uh, Fampredine, uh, uh, which was referred to by uh, Mr Adam. And that is because the companies have not put forward the submission to the uh, Scottish Medicines, Medicines Consortium, uh, but the government has met with uh, the pharmaceutical companies and we would recognise patients should not have to argue for access to these drugs on an individual 
basis, and we hope the uh, companies will put forward a good uh, quality submission at a fair uh, price to the Scottish Medicine Consortium in order for patients in Scotland to be able to uh, benefit from uh, these uh, medicines. Uh, and indeed, I'll give way briefly to uh, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. I am grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. He is right in, in relation to the uh, availability of medicines, and it seems to be one of the improvements that has been made over uh, the last few years. But as the MS Society were making clear to, to me earlier on this afternoon, uh, a gap appears to be in relation to the treatments for progressive uh, MS. And, and is that something perhaps that he and his uh, discussions with the SMC and others might be able to, to try and accelerate some progress over the, the next couple of years or so? Well, I suppose I would go back to my fundamental point. All treatments for MS that have been submitted by pharmaceutical companies to the SMC have been recommended for use. So we actually need the companies to come forward uh, uh, to uh, uh, make a, a bid to the SMC. Uh, and I, I suppose I'm making the point that we would welcome uh, that uh, if uh, the companies were to come uh, forward. George Adams spoke uh, about the impact that welfare reforms are having on those with a, a diagnosis of, of MS. As, Vital. I believe that the Scottish Government, local government, and the third sector work together to develop a, a joined-up expression of our collective efforts to mitigate, as far as we possibly can, the worst uh, impacts of the welfare reforms being taken forward by uh, the UK uh, Government. We are working with the NHS, COSLA, disability organisations, and the third sector to understand the impact of welfare reform on disabled people and on uh, services. We have put in place a, a range of measures to allow us to identify whether public health is being harmed by uh, welfare reforms. This will allow us to take steps to continue mitigating uh, the worst uh, outcomes. As part of this, health boards have been given uh, tools to allow them to identify those at greatest risk of their health being harmed uh, and to take steps to help people to access support within their communities. Uh, I want to uh, refer, because a number of members, uh, Malcolm Chisholm and Lewis MacDonald in particular, uh, talked about the asbestos nurse funding, which was uh, announced by the First Minister uh, previously. Of course, the First Minister announced that motor neuron disease asbestos nurses it would be the uh, first to uh, it be uh, utilise uh, that uh, funding, some £700,000 uh, £700, from the uh, overall £2.5 million uh, pot will go towards specialist nursing care and support to those with motor uh, neuron uh, disease. Uh, I know that uh, those with other conditions such as MS and the organisations that campaign for them are interested to see where uh, the Scottish Government will go with the remainder of uh, these funds. The allocation of uh, the remaining funds will be informed by a review or specialist uh, nursing services being uh, currently being undertaken by the government. I would say it is important to recognise there has been an increase in the number of MS nurse specialists and uh, nurse specialists with neurology or neuroscience uh, specialism in recent years uh, to have uh, time. President. Very briefly. Tell me why the um, Scottish Government have withdrawn funding for the Neurological Alliance of Scotland. Minister. Okay, I thought it might actually be about the area of my speech I was uh, making, but I, I, I would uh, observe that we fund a range of organisations, and all the members of that alliance are also members of the Health and Social Care Alliance, and we would uh, recognise that they can come together to uh, uh, make uh, collective efforts. We will always be very happy to engage with uh, the individual uh, organisations uh, as well. We have a, a, a relationship with uh, all of them already. Just to uh, finish the point... Uh, do I have time, President? If it's very brief. Again, very briefly. Given the concerns of various organisations such as MND Scotland and Parkinson's UK about that, will he agree to meet those organisations to discuss the neurological alliance? Minister. I, I, I will always be very happy to uh, meet with organisations who seek to, to meet with me. So I make that commitment to uh, Malcolm Chairs and other members of uh, any organisation wants to contact me. I'll be happy uh, to respond. Just to finish the point about the area that I was uh, trying to touch upon in terms of the specialist nurse funding. The chief uh, nursing officer will be writing to NHS uh, boards in the next week or so about uh, that uh, particular fund. In conclusion, President Officer, I do want to assure you and other members that we are uh, fully committed to working in partnership with the third sector in addressing any inequities of care and making the necessary positive and lasting healthcare changes for the benefit uh, of all those people living with a neurological condition, including uh, MS across uh, Scotland. And once more, can I thank George Adam for bringing forward this debate this evening. Thank you, Minister. And can I thank all members who have taken part in the debate? And I now close this meeting.